All right. Um, it's 3.01 on my clock. I guess we'll slowly but surely get started. Um, I know there are organizers of the waste meeting on this call. Please feel free to chime in if you'd like, but um, as in moderator of this session, I'd like to welcome you to the very first session of the waste meeting on grounding zone, uh, zones in ice shelves. Um, you can see the schedule for this session on your screen. I hope you can. If not, please do sh shut out. And uh, as usual, talks are um, 10 minutes, eight minute talk, then two minutes, uh, very brief questions uh, with the exchange of presenters. And uh, by a long-standing tradition of these meetings, we'll have um, an extended discussion after all talks, after the last talk of this session given by Matt Hoffman. Uh, and all presenters uh, will be available to answer any questions that you might possibly have. So uh, with that, I'll ask um, Christian, Thomas to share his screen and uh, we'll start our presentation. Yeah, thank you, Olga. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Christian Wald and I'm a postdoc at Oregon State working with the Tarzan project, which is part of the ITGC. Today, I'd like to talk about recent changes on Thwaites Glacier, but first of all, let's acknowledge my co-authors, the rest of the Tarzan on ice team and some of my collaborators without whom this talk would have been impossible. We start off with an animation from MODIS starting in 2002 running to 2018. And there's certainly many, many things that you can see here. First of all, the fast flowing Western ice tongue referred to as the twit in this talk down in grid south here and the much slower flowing Eastern ice shelf called the Theus in the grid north out here. Until 1996, the twit was confined by a pinning point but lost its contact until 2009. The Theus has still been depressed by a pinning point that you see out here. And that pinning point originates from the same seafloor ridge that used to betress the twit, um, but it's still active and is causing much slower ice dis discharge on the Theus. In 2005 and 2006, there was a maximum drag between the two. So we had a very, very strong shear zone and the Thwaites ice tongue dragged the Theus along and caused the swarm of crevasses appear on the grounding line that we see here in dark, that's since been advected onto the Theus and is getting buried by snow accumulation. The twit and the Theus separated in 2008 to 2009 and the twit shortly broke off afterwards in the 2012 Antarctic field season. And because this talk is about changes and changes are also always from a reference, we start with our reference and I'd like to look at some published data as reference. We have the RIMA surface elevation model in this area data was acquired in 2013 um, it tells us surface elevations were 20 to 14, 14 meters. Bed machine says this corresponds to around three to 500 meters in ice thickness. Measures origins in this area from around 2012 and shows, aha, uh -huh, the twit is around one order of magnitude faster than the Theus. The grounding line here in black is from 2011 and in gray from 2017. We see that the grounding line has retreated. We've lost former pinning points and we see this formation of what is called the butterfly region out here that has been the focus of another expedition last field season. And I've used all of these published data sets here to run an elastic tidal flexure model that predicts where is the ice freely floating and where is it grounded. So in this area here, you can see the red means ice is freely floating and where you have a rainbow that means ice is being bended by the ocean tides. And I can see, aha, the pinning point out here is active and bending the ice. One area here is this white polygon outline that you see. And this is the safe area for field operations 
where we did a lot of field work last field season. I want to zoom into that now. What I've done a lot was driving around a ski do. And while I was doing this, I had a GPS on the ski do recording surface elevation. And what I show you here in the top left panel is the difference between what I recorded on my tracks to what's published in RIMA. And this difference is up to 15 meters in this particular area out here. And because we know when RIMA was acquired, I told you that's in 2013, and I also know when my GPS is acquired, I can calculate an average rate of surface lowering over these seven years, which is around 1.5 meters per year in this area. Then I wanted to know, can I set to a laser altimeter also detect these changes? And yes, it can. Um, it's on the same order of magnitude and it has it nicely covers the area out here. And we've already learned that this area is free floating in the ocean. And at these sites where I was driving my ski due to, I used an AP res to take very, very accurate measurements of ice thickness. But I can also compare this ice thickness measurement at these sites to what is being published. And the difference is up to 150 meters. That's almost a third of the ice thickness in this area. Um, and because I also know when I took my PRS measurements, I can calculate the corresponding thinning rate since 2013, which is around 15 meters in this area. Um, there's also last field season, the ITGC radar um, on a plane that flew these tracks and also this radar picked up these trends. So now I got really, really interested. What can we learn from these radar data? So here you see an example flying from the grounded part of Thwaites Glacier across the tidal flexure zone onto the freely floating ice shelf in red here and crosses the pinning point on the right hand side here. And what it does along the way is that the plane measures surface elevation, internal layers and ice thickness and I overlaid this radiogram here um, with some bed machine bed data to show you where it's being grounded and where it's not. And what I can do is that I calculate how much would the ice stick out of the ocean, which is represented here by a geoid model in dashed purple, um, if it's freely floating. And I've done that, that's the dashed white line, which means everywhere where the ice is above this white line, ice is well grounded, which is on the left-hand side here. But on the right-hand side at the pinning point, the ice is very, very close to flotation. And now I was very interested, ah, what's going to happen if the pinning point goes and what happens if the ice turn goes or what happened in the past? So I used ISSM to do some perturbation experiments. I used the diagnostic higher order model from ISSM fed in the 2011 gra grounding line and these published data sets and played around on changing the domain. That means including the Thwaites ice tongue or excluding it or including the pinning point and excluding it. So this gives me these four combinations that you see here on the left. The pinning point with both, removing one, removing the other and removing both. And what's plotted here is the velocity, the model solution on the left column and on the right column is the difference to what measures used to see. Um, and let's start, um, we see that measures was acquired when the pinning point and the twit were still present. So the top row can be considered as what is called a control run. Then we remove the pinning point in the second row. And we see that the ice is accelerating drastically. And this is because the Thwaites ice tongue is dragging the ice along at this time and causes these large, large surface velocities. If we include the pinning point again, but removing the ice tongue, the ice slows down compared to what happens um, with Rima. And at the bottom is a very, very futuristic, think of it, model run where we remove the ice tongue and we remove the pinning point. And we see that the ice flow is accelerating all the way up to the grounding line and even into this area, which is now the butterfly region. But I wanna focus more a little bit on this pinning point. And what I show you here in the left in white are streamlines that origin from measures around 2009. And in black is my model, including a full strength pinning point 
with the Thwaites ice tongue. And these streamlines almost match perfectly, except in the grid's southern end of the pinning point, where we see that the observed velocities from measures already push into the pinning point. It tells me it's not as well grounded as in my model, so there is probably some ungrounding happening already. Now the ice tongue broke off in 2011, 2012. We can do the same experiment with removing the ice tongue, but still keeping the pinning point. Then my black streamlines rotate anti-clockwise. And I want to validate that with some recent feature tracking from Landsat 2019. That's just these white lines that show you that this area of flux divergence has expanded. And now thin ice, damaged ice, is being advected onto the Thwaites pinning point from further upstream from this area here. I wanted to validate all of that with some GPS measurements, but we could only operate in this one area here that's even safe. And here you can see the um, flow vectors from the GPSs that very well match these um, streamlines. Um, let's wrap up. And this here is a Sentinel-1 animation, a bit more recent, what's going on at Thwaites. First of all, we see this formation of rifts coming from the pinning point going traverse to ice flow upstream into the glacier. And this here is a spanned of crevasses that's being formed in 2005. And Aaron Pettit is going to talk about this in the second part of this session. So let's conclude. The Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf surface has lowered around 1.5 meters per year since 2013. This corresponds to an ice thinning of up to 50 meters per year in certain areas. Large parts of the Thwaites pinning point are very, very close to the hydrostatic equilibrium. This reduces its buttressing to the Eastern Ice Shelf, eases the ice discharge across the ground line and causes further acceleration even far upstream. We've also just learned that these rifts are developing um, further against the ice flow. And this is being called the daggers in our team. Um, I haven't managed to pull out some ballpark numbers for you. What I estimate that the removal of the pinning point will um, cause in the future, but I want to do that. And with that, I'd like to thank all my co-authors and especially the Tarzan field team for a tireless commitment last season. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, very quick questions, like literally just clarification or something uh, for Christian. I would suggest you use raise hand option. It's uh, in participants. If you move your mouse down to the um, Zoom frame, there is a participant um, button, and then you can see raise hand option. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you have questions, please use that option. If not, if you cannot find it, just type in the chat box. If there are no questions, then um, the next speaker is Ronya Rees. Ronya, perhaps you could start sharing your screen. Great. Yes, thanks a lot, Olga. Uh, then should I just start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, hello. Um, I'm Ronja uh, from the Potsdam, or I'm a postdoc at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Um, and uh, today I want to speak uh, about the role of history and strength of the ocean forcing and sea level projections from Antarctica. And I really want to focus on the ocean forcing. And um, this work would not, of course, not have been um, uh, been able to do without my courses, unless Lieberman, Trost, and Albrecht, Elencio, C, and Ricardo Winkelmann. And uh, it's really part of the ISMIP 6 project. So uh, maybe some of you uh, know about the project or are also involved in it. Just last week, there was a whole yeah, set of publications coming out related to the project. And also this uh, work I will present today uh, was just published last week. Um, so we ran simulations or projections um, for the Antarctic ice sheet with a parallel ice sheet model, uh, which uh, is PISM, it's thermodynamically coupled, the finite difference model, uh, which is co-developed at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks and um, at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. 
And the figures you can see here show ice peak and ice thickness for an um, Antarctic initial configuration at a kilometer horizontal resolution. And based on this initial configuration, uh, we ran sea level projections and we did so by um, following the protocol of three different model intercomparison projects. So I will talk quite a bit about the MIPS. I want to uh, present them shortly. So the first one is, is MIPS 6, uh, which is uh, led by um, Sophie Novicki and the Antarctic contribution by Ellen Silsi. And ISMIP 6 stands for Ice Sheet Model Intercomparison Project for CMIP 6. So, this is really the first time that ice sheet models did take part in an um, CMIP initiative and, and tried or, yeah, to run sea level projections in, in that regard. The second one uh, I will name a bit is the LARMIP 2 project. Um, uh, LARMIP stands for Linear Response Model Intercomparison Project. So this is also an intercomparison project uh, that aims to, um, to create sea level projections um, based on linear response functions. So from uh, ice sheet model um, simulations, linear response functions are estimated and these are then used to uh, derive sea level projections. And uh, we also tested the init MIP um, which is a part of ISMIP 6 and um, was designed to test the initial configurations in different ice sheet models. And we found that for our initial configurations, really results are close to the median in all three of these model intercomparison projects. So they are kind of uh, representative for the median model response. Uh, however, we ran the, the two first, uh, these two upper uh, intercomparison projects to do projections and found that the response in or the sea level projections uh, differed quite a lot. So um, the figure here on the right hand side shows sea level projections for the high emission scenario RCP 8.5. And we found that uh, our ISMIP 6 projections range only up to four centimeters of sea level rise, uh, which is really at the lower end of the very likely range in the LAMA 2 sea level projections. So there's really a huge difference between these projections. And uh, these simulations are based only on ocean forcing. So um, these changes really should already be visible in the basal melt rates. So uh, projected basal melt rates um, in both cases are based on the CMIP-5 model ocean forcing. However, that it's applied a bit differently. So in ISMIP-6, we follow the open protocol, which means um, that we, we use uh, output from selected CMIP-5 models to drive individual melt rate parameterizations. In our case, this is uh, PICO, which is an ocean box model approach. And uh, in LARM2, on the other hand, uh, as I said, uh, response functions are emulated from simplified experiments, and these can be, then be applied to melt rate distributions. These are done for individual regions that are shown up on the upper uh, right side uh, panel. And uh, these melt rate distributions are then estimated from global mean temperature scale to ocean temperatures. And in this case, the CMIP-5 models are used to derive the scaling factors. And then uh, the ocean temperatures are translated into melt rate changes. And uh, I will talk a bit later on how this is done. Um, this figure shows, for example, melt rate changes in the Amundsen Sea with the gray range being the Lamet range and um, the colored lines showing the ISMA six um, um, metric rate changes in our projections. So with the solid lines being averaged over the entire ice shelves and the dashed lines being just close to the grounding line where uh, melt rate changes matter more. Um, but still close to the grounding line, melt rates change uh, less than the median. And this is even more pronounced uh, when we look at uh, other regions, for example, the Weddell Sea area here. Ooh. In the Weddell Sea region, uh, MET rates increase less than the very likely range used in environment. And this can be boiled down to the MET rate sensitivity. So how much MET rates uh, change with ocean temperature change. 
In LARMIP2, um, ocean temperatures are transformed into maldrates using um, a constant factor between 7 to 16 meters per year per degree of warming. Um, while in, um, in the ISMAP experiment, we use our own um, maldrate parameterization PICO. And we estimated the sensitivity here following, um, uh, following uh, sim uh, simple step forcing experiments. So we increase ocean temperatures and then simply diagnose maltrates. And I don't want to go in all details here, but the, the blue dots show how maltrates change in the Fischner-Ronnie eye shell. And this is compared to the range used in LAMA here with the gray bars. So this is really much smaller. Maltrate changes are a bit higher in close to the grounding line, which are these boxes, but still lower than the likely range um, at the LAMA range. And this is also true for the Amundsen Sea region, uh, where med rates really uh, are higher, but track the lower um, range used in LAMA 2. So overall, the sensitivity in our ISMIP 6 experiments is uh, lower, which originates uh, from PICO parameters and how they're tuned in this case. We tested the sensitivity in a couple simulation for Swayze Glacier. Uh, where Elaine estimated the sensitivity to lie around uh, 6 to 60 meters per year per degree of warming, so really closer to uh, the estimates used in LARMIP. And this finding is also in line um, with other findings from Nico Jordan and Elaine in the ISMAP 6 project that really the ocean or the sensitivity of your metroid parameterization matters. And with that, I want to wrap up. So um, we um, looked into sea level projections and found that really uh, the maltrate sensitivity in your parametrization can determine the order of magnitude um, of sea level rise. So as a next step, we want to use um, yeah, observed or modeled melt sensitivities to improve the parametrization, and then also um, as a next step to hand casting experiments. That's another part of uh, the study that I didn't talk to that about today. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Ronya. Are there any questions? Okay, here is a question from Tor. Tor, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes, I can do so. Hi, Ronya, thanks. I was just wondering, you, you uh, explained the PICO method. I wonder, did you use the uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan uh, melt rate parameterization that was proposed for the ISMIP 6 runs in your PISM uh, setup? Uh, no, I didn't use them. I just used PICO in this case. Um, however, I looked at uh, the response in, in the in ISMIP as well as in the ISMIP um, results in comparison to other models that use the parameterization from uh, Nico. And uh, he had two different ways to tune the parameterizations. And uh, the results I found here are comparable to the um, to the tuning that gives uh, also, or how do you call that, like the less sensitive tuning, let's say so. So it seems to be pretty much in line with the very, or the, the un unsensitive tuning uh, uh, propo proposed in the Jordan paper. Um, there is also this alternative tuning, which is based on Pilot Island Glacier ice shelf uh, mat rates. And this seems to be more in line with, uh, with the LAMRIP estimates. Right. Thanks. Yeah. And Tor, you could, uh, could you please share your screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Should come here. And we start with all the Zoom stuff. OK. Do people see the pointer and the slides? If yes, everything is working. Yeah, please. Then I will just continue. Okay, well, thanks. I try to get this into eight minutes. It's really a wrap up of the last, uh, well, at least five years of work that uh, uh, we've done on, on Filch and Ronnie uh, on, on a collaborative project with uh, Avi and, and Bas mainly. Uh, I've since then changed company by being back at the Polar Institute in Tromso. Uh, but it's all about the question, what, what can happen to Fitch and Ronnie Ice in the future? And that's, of course, because some model, models have suggested that there will be warm water entering the cavity 
within the future because of uh, changes of the circulation in that region. And um, this is just a quick recap uh, what, what these models have been said, but also the, the graph on the bottom shows that there's still a very large uncertainty. So the, the, the gray uh, shade shows sort of the, the um, CMIP5 bottom temperature representation in the what could be a Filchner trough in the CMIP models there. So, so there's really a wide range. And even the two RV models that have been used for projections show very different temperatures. But what is sort of established now is that there is a certain mechanism where um, there's dense water being produced on the western part of the continental shelf and that's what's blocking the warm water from, from entering the ice shelf cavity and uh, that, that is sort of a, a mechanism that, that has been uh, investigated by a couple of studies uh, um, and, and seems to be a robust thing that needs to happen to remove this density barrier for this uh, warm water to enter. And uh, coming from that perspective and also wondering whether there is any warm water flowing in, there has been an initiative in the recent uh, years with um, uh, pulling together logistic efforts on, on getting moorings under the ice shelf and also doing a lot of um, open ocean work. And uh, I've been a lot involved in this hot water drilling uh, underneath the ice shelf and we have a few sites currently being instrumented that still collect data that have been rigged for long-term monitoring. Well, the batteries are still contained in the instruments, so long-term for us means maybe five years, maybe more. So it's soon coming to an end, but uh, these are sort of the, the main results of, of these uh, Filchner borehole sites that, that we have uh, acquired. And on the uh, small side comment on the, on the bottom line, we would have planned for nice one to two year maintenance cycles, but then COVID-19 and the, the ITGC uh, happened and that sort of uh, disrupted our, our maintenance cycles. So, uh, well, I, I'm afraid things are going to be buried this or next season. Um, anyways, it just this is really throwing the main data at, at, at your face. Uh, this is from the northern mooring sites and there is this uh, Hoffmuller diagram on the upper right. Oh, yeah. Have this pointer here where you see that temperatures at these northern moorings have been uh, warmer and then cool sort of on not on a seasonal but on an interannual scale and also this happened in the Filchner trough there have been sections consecutive sections in 17 and 18 that show that what has been water at the freezing point here has been replaced by ice shelf water way below the freezing point in temperature uh, salinity space that looks like this and um, in in the oceanographer's world, we, we usually use these uh, fingerprints to relate that to certain source water masses. And this is not only a change in temperature, but also a change in salinity that points at that there has been water that has been locally produced here, now being replaced by water that has circulated the cavity and comes out here. And that's very much in line with the traditional understanding of this uh, cavity circulation and sort of hints at this this mode where you produce dense water on this side has been strengthening over this period when the change occurred. Um, and that's something I, would, I will come back to a couple of times now. Um, just a little bit, so why we know this, we know from cross sections uh, along the entire ice front, we know these water masses that are there and this really salty water you only find in the West, whereas uh, this locally derived Bergner high salinity shelf water, that, that is, sort of uh, having a shorter access, whereas the other water mass, the Ronnie water, has to traverse the entire cavity. So from that, um, and also from the time series at the different moorings, we monitor this source water salinities, and we really see at the northern sites there was this shift, but there has also been, or there have also been individual pulses in different years further upstream where uh, that, that seemed to propagate through there. It, it's a little bit messy, but basically you want to see this black peak reappearing here and together this, this long-term black increase is also mirrored here. So that's altogether sort of a shift from the partition cavity circulation where you have an own circulation cell here to sort of the, the coherent uh, far uh, field driven circulation due to that um, dense water formation on this side. And um, we try to trace that down, try to relate that to sea ice formation rates in the Ronnie Polynia. This again are the, are the detailed time series, but you see on the 
on the horizontal lines that all these years had CS formation rates that were above the uh, long-term average for that on the annual means. Um, this data has been derived well from proxies, uh, error data, and then CIS cover, and so on. Um, so, so there is a hint that since 2015, this remote-driven circulation has been sped up. Um, and then if you go back, use this simple CIS formation rate proxy and, and reconstruct the longer time series for the error period, you actually see that there has been an increase in this period. And there have been papers earlier that said that Ronicolina has sort of been declining in its strength and so on, but suddenly it kicked in again, and that also drove this change in circulation mode. Um, there have been historical data that showed that there have been circ different circulation modes present. Another strong event is associated with this uh, known strong collinear activity in 1998. But the question is really, what, what drove this recent increase that we also capture with our moorings? Um, and looking at these um, proxies, it's really the amount of open water in front of the Ronnie Ice Shelf that, that is the main driver. And that um, made us looking closer into what the, what the mechanisms are for that are computed with composites for all events, high CS formation rate events that are marked with blue dots. And an atmospheric composite looks a little bit like this, uh, the uh, atmospheric anomaly, you get a strong negative pressure anomaly and positive pressure anomaly in these two regions. And that gives you a cyclonic, uh, cyclonic circulation over the Ronnie ice shelf, uh, which then opens up this collinear and, and drives this. So it's, it's less a temperature signal than sort of a large scale pressure gradient driven wind signal, offshore winds that open up the collinear here that, that drive uh, um, the, the formation rates. And even so, Correlating the pressure difference between these two points with the CS formation here, here gives you a, a positive or give, gives you sort of a, a correlation, uh, a significant correlation here. Um, now, what is driving these pressure uh, gradients or what is driving these pressure anomalies in these two regions? For that, um, I looked a little bit further in sort of large scale circulation um, proxies and it's. I'm, I'm now coming to sort of an understanding that it's, that it's a connection between um, an, an increasing SAM, which generally gives you lower pressures around the continent. So that means that this recent increase in SAM is associated with stronger negative anomalies in this region. And at the same time, there's the Amundsen Sea Low, which is a very known large scale variability uh, atmospheric uh, um, uh, pressure system that is moving back and forth east and west here. And there has been a shift to um, a, further, a further westward location of this Amundsen Sea Low, which sort of gives place for higher pressures in this region, basically. And, and that together then uh, sets up this, this situation where you have strong pressure gradients across the ice front that, that open up the pollinia. And in fact, it's, uh, so, so the correlation between the Amundsen Sea Low position and the pressure in here is, is pretty strongly correlated. Um, so it's, it's sort of the combination of these, both of these effects that, that has happened uh, and that has driven this opening. So uh, just to summarize, we have been camping for months on this ice shelf and we have basically observed very, very small salinity changes. That gave us an idea that the cavity circulation has recently switched in a circulation mode. And this is sort of the first time that we have proper evidence can trace those signals through the entire cavity and really nail it down what has happened. And we could associate, it that, associate that with, with a change in uh, CS formation rates in front of the Ronnie ice shelf. And uh, then uh, this, this, uh, the evolution of this uh, CIS um, formation rate uh, anomalies could be related to these large scale atmospheric patterns. So the implication for this in the current models, we're looking at a warming signal basically which shoves off the sea ice formation here. But it seems like for present state or for the climate system that we have today, really these large scale circulation changes which, which are happening due to what, what, whatever reason are, are still the dominant source of variability that we're seeing in this region. And it's not so much sort of a warming signal that is going on here, but, but it's this uh, large scale interplay of, of uh, atmospheric, 
atmospheric circulation modes that is currently dominating the, uh, yeah, the, the variability of, of circulation beneath Pilsner on the ice shelf. I guess that's it. Thank you, Dor. Uh, quick questions for Tor. All right. If there are no questions, Christina, could you please share your screen? The next speaker is Christina Fulba. Yep, I'm looking on it. There we go. Is that there? Yep. Uh, great. Kia ora koutou katoa. Hare mai ki taku korero. Hello everybody. Welcome to my talk. I'm uh, Christina Holba. I'm coming to you from sunny Oripori, Dunedin, uh, here in New Zealand. Happy to uh, still be at the Waste Workshop. What I'm going to talk about today is a really small slice through the work that we've been doing at this camp out in the middle of the Ross Ice Shelf. Uh, over a series of years. We've moved on now to a, to a new site. Um, this work involved a number of collaborating institutions, key funding from the New Zealand Antarctic Research Institute, now transitioned into the New Zealand Antarctic Science Platform with uh, logistic support from Antarctica New Zealand. In case I run out of time, here are my conclusions up front. Um, they mirror exactly the title uh, the ice that we're looking at out in the middle of the ice shelf, um, the accreted ice that we see on the bottom of the ice shelf is something that's recognized lots of places by a mismatch between what uh, the uh, surface elevation of the ice shelf would imply is the base of the ice shelf and what you image as the brightest return in radar. When that mismatch occurs, we interpret that as accreted ice on the bottom of the ice shelf typically of marine origin. What I'm going to say today is that you need to have a more diverse uh, set of processes in mind when we see that kind of ice on the bottom of the ice shelf. Um, we have um, several lines of evidence to indicate to us that that's terrestrial ice. That has implications then for what we think about heterogeneity in ice properties in ice shelves, what we think about um, these kinds of signals with respect to ice ocean interaction on the underside of the ice shelf. And then additionally interpretation for the seafloor sedimentary record. And two images here we'll look at again, but they're of the, the deep ice at this site and of the seabed where we see loads of terrestrial drop stones, uh, ice rafted debris, but without any icebergs in view. So an overall map of the whole continent showing you the orange tent there where we're working out in the middle uh, of the Ross Ice Shelf. If we zoom in and look just at surface elevation in a narrow elevation band here colored in so we can see the streak lines and uh, variation in um, thickness of the ice uh, with various tributaries coming into the ice shelf and we trace a streak line back upstream from our site. The ice that uh, we're working in has come from the Live Glacier, which is a pretty moderate glacier that flows through the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, uh, with delivering ice from East Antarctica and, of course, locally collected. The ice at our site is about 370 meters thick. We've made two boreholes using a hot water drilling system through the ice uh, at this site. Uh, the first one we drilled in the out of doors was using a system that was built at uh, Victoria University of Wellington. And then the second hole, 500 meters upflow from that site uh, inside our big, beautiful uh, orange drilling tent. Uh, what I want to do now is just dive down through the borehole to see what the ice looks like. So we're following along with a NIWA um, camera and a light uh, riding along with a really big battery. So we're going down here through the fern uh, into, the, into the water well and through the glacier ice. And the important thing to see here is that it's bubble rich glacier ice as we would expect to see. So this isn't particularly thick ice. It isn't a particularly thick glacier that the ice is coming from uh, in this flow band. And then the bottom 60 meters looks more or less like this. Bubble pour shot through with sediment. 
if we keep going down, here's the base of the ice shelf. We're looking now kind of obliquely. And you can see, again, that, that bubble pour uh, sediment containing ice and a very thin layer of very fresh crystals on the underside of the ice shelf there. If we keep heading down toward the seabed, there's the seabed, um, a range of class sizes falling out from the ice shelf slowly over time with some very fine um, clay material as well. Here I'm showing you what that material looks like and the interface between the bubbly glacier ice and this uh, accreted ice on the base of the ice shelf. In the middle of the slide, that's a reaming tool when it's come back up from enlarging the borehole and uh, it's brought a lot of sediment with it. You can see that there is a range of grain sizes, indeed from very large pebbles to very fine uh, clay. And then on the right hand part of the slide, we have just right above and at the transition between these two ices. We saw the same transition in both boreholes, and it looks similar in both boreholes. So what you're looking, you're looking down the borehole here. And um, the top image there on the right is in that bubble rich glacier ice. The bottom image there is right at the interface. So these are stills that were pulled out of the NILA video. You see that the uh, transition is sharp. You see that at this location, it's at a high angle and you see sediment um, all throughout that ice and potentially even a little ice build fracture here coming off of the interface. So here's kind of the, um, the borehole schematic interpretation. We have 300 meters of what we expected to see, this uh, bubbly glacier ice, 60 meters on the base of this accreted ice uh, with sediment within it. Uh, Adam Smith at GNS Science here in uh, New Zealand has looked at the sand and pebble size fractions of the material in the ice and on the seabed. He finds them to be uh, very similar and uh, to be consistent with the central transantarctic mountain source for both. So it's terrestrial uh, sediment, it's terrestrial accreted ice at the uh, base of the ice shelf. So here's your mental model uh, then for what's going on. If we think about the flow trajectory, the ice comes out of Lewis Glacier, hangs out along the coast for a while as it joins the flow of the Ross ice shelf and then uh, turns north into the ice shelf flow. And not much is happening at the base. We're preserving that ice. Um, we have one thickness measurement of this stuff, right? It's near our, our borehole site there where the orange camp is. But not much has happened to it to preserve that much accreted ice uh, along this trajectory. Here's the source, um, the origin story for this ice is Liv Glacier uh, flowing down through the Transantarctic Mountains. And the, the formation mechanism that we envision, if we think about uh, where these uh, tributary glaciers are coming together, flowing through the coastal mountains, there's a constriction there. We get lateral compression that generates a crevasse field on the surface and at the base. And what we imagine is happening is that meltwater, basal meltwater from the glacier catchment is rising up into those basal crevasses, taking sediment with it and freezing. And then that flow joins the ice shelf. So what we've done next is image that ice uh, you know, with radar. We've used a phase sensitive radar and the profiling radar system that we uh, borrowed and continue to borrow from Ginny Catania uh, to have a look in more detail at the site. So here's our campsite out in the middle of the ice shelf there. You can see um, kind of the campsite right in the middle here where all the action is. A few different years worth of different radar observations. The colorful lines are all uh, flow traces that we can track back upstream to some origin in a combination of Landsat imagery and the modus mosaic of Antarctica. The important lines for us here in the next couple of slides are the ones that I've labeled there, the live glacier right margin as best we can find it. And uh, the left margin is somewhere between those two uh, blue lines and our borehole site is somewhere in there as well. 
we zoom in and look in more detail at the various lines we've driven, what I'm going to show you is along this purple line uh, here. So you can see our two borehole sites uh, 500 meters apart, uh, a long flow. And then if we look at the radar profiling, this is 7 megahertz um, monopole system that we're dragging along the surface. And what I want you to notice here, the green line, or what I hope you notice here, the green line is where the base of the ice would be predicted to be uh, just using hydrostatic equilibrium. So the surface elevation translated into a matching bed elevation. And what you see is along a lot of the uh, profile, those match pretty well, or that matches pretty well with the bright return from the base of the ice shelf. But here in the flow band, that's not the case at all. Uh, the apparent bed or apparent base of the ice shelf uh, comes upward. But we know that's not where the base of the ice shelf is. Usually when we see a mismatch like this, or always, I guess, when we see a mismatch like this, we say, ah, there's accreted ice on the bottom. And what we're saying is it might not be marine. Now, in this case, it's certainly terrestrial in origin. So our borehole is somewhere over here um, on the left, left side of uh, the flow band. But we see this nice thick lozenge um, of the secreted ice all across the Live Glacier flow band. And we see it um, when we look, when we drive across with other sections as well. So I'm going to show you next uh, this blue line and then turning to drive a long flow. So here, um, this is color coded up at the top. The rightmost part of this profile is driving across uh, flow into the Live Glacier flow band. And then where that pink line is, we turn. And now we're going along flow. And what you see is a lot of off-axis um, signal, right? So this view, uh, this, the nature of the profile, the nature of the turn from that deep ice, this rough uh, interface with lots of, um, well, lots of roughness uh, is consistent with an interpretation that there are basal crevasses that have been filled in with that um, meltwater and refrozen. If we zoom out and think about uh, many kinds of flow traces or many kinds of flow bands through the ice shelf, we've got Again, a heterogeneous mixture, right? We've got glacier outlets, we've got uh, suture zones, we've got shear margins. So we've driven some long lines across as many of these kinds of transitions as we can in order to look for either more examples of this kind of ice or different kinds of conditions. So uh, we're going to zoom in on another moderate glacier, the Hood Glacier. Uh, right here on the flow band coming from the Hood Glacier. Right here, this green line again on the bottom is what, uh, where the base would be predicted according to hydrostatic equilibrium. And if we zoom in here, we see that again, in a moderate glacier, we've got the same kind of signal. There's a nice kind of classic suture zone uh, next door. Uh, so a place where um, the ice that's coming into the ice shelf was between two outlet glaciers, and we expect there to be significant uh, accretion of marine ice, so freezing from the ocean onto the base of the ice shelf. It is the least interesting part uh, of this profile, or things that we think are suture zone ice are uh, least interesting things about these profiles. And what's going on within the glaciers themselves and basal processes within the glaciers that are translating into properties uh, of the deepest part of the ice shelf turn out to be quite interesting indeed. So I'll wrap up with that and I'll just reiterate my, my conclusions. That ice that you know is accreted on down there might not be what you think it is. Um, there are implications for ice properties. There are implications for what we think is happening at the ice ocean interface. And there are implications for how we interpret sedimentation on the seafloor. We've got along this flow band, lots of ice rafted debris, but the rafting happened before there was ever an iceberg around. And I'll end with that. 
Great, thank you, Christina. Quick questions to Christina. All right, uh, if there are no very brief questions, we'll have a break. It will be actually shorter than 10 minutes. Let's have five minutes and yeah, we'll reconvene in five minutes. The meeting is on, so feel free to chat or interact. And the second part of the session will be chaired by Lou Ann. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Lou Ann. I'm a postdoc from University of California, Irvine, and I'm glad to be a co convener for this session. Uh, to keep on the schedule, so we can start our second session for the next three speakers. Uh, the first one is Alex. I saw Alex. Are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, you can start to share your screen, and uh, everyone who have question could type in the chat or maybe after his talk and you can ask. Yeah, we see your screen. Okay, I am unmuted. <laughs> All right, um, thanks um, to, to Lou and Olga for um, moderating a great session and uh, also to the conveners um, of WACE for, for putting together a great virtual workshop. So um, today I'm going to talk um, about some work that I've uh, recently been doing with um, Sam Pegler and Jenny Catania, Dennis Felix, and, and uh, Lauren Simpkins. And um, we're sort of trying to reevaluate the question of why it seems to be the case that so many marine terminating glaciers seem to stabilize um, at bed peaks for long periods of time. So oh, to get started with that, we can sort of, uh, we can begin with the conventional stability theory for marine terminating glaciers. So you go back to Christian Schuch's 2007 paper or a number of other early studies, um, a few assumptions are made in order to um, come to the um, predictions about the stability of marine terminating glaciers on reverse sloping beds. Um, one is that um, buttressing um, was typically taken to be negligible in these early studies. Uh, basal and driving stress is high up to the grounding line um, in, in their simple model. And also bed slope um, and changes in bed slope are taken to be negligible. So the last 10 years have been uh, really uh, sort of wonderful for this area of research because um, it's been shown in a number of studies um, sort of starting with one by Hilmar Goodmanson in 2012, that the first assumption that buttressing is negligible um, tends to be wrong in places where there are narrow or just um, heavily buttressing ice shelves. Um, and then this theory, um, this original theory for grounding line flux has been revised in subsequent papers um, by, by Christian Schuch, Marianne Hasselhoff, uh, Olga and Sam Pegler to account for this buttressing effect. Um, in other studies, um, have focused on looking at changes in uh, basal shear stress and also driving stress. So uh, a recent really nice paper by, by Olga um, and Duncan Wingham in Journal of Glaciology um, showed that uh, a lot of the, uh, or that the, the second assumption would be invalid in places where you have weak basal friction or driving stress. And so you can get situations, for example, where you have, even in the absence of a buttressing ice shelf, uh, stable grounding lines on reverse sloping beds. Um, then in other places where Coulomb stress might apply near the grounding line um, or where you have temporal fluctuations in basal shear stress um, can also invalidate this other assumption. So what I'm going to talk today briefly about is really about this third assumption, um, which is that bed slope is negligible um, and changes in bed slope are negligible in the vicinity of the grounding line. And so this assumption leads to sort of two predictions. Um, one is that grounding line should be the most stable in places where the bed is the most forward sloping or the most prograde. Um, and also that when grounding lines do stabilize just downstream of bed peaks, they should be strongly vulnerable to changes in climate or fluctuations in climate um, because they're so close to a reverse sloping bed. Um, but we know that this is actually not true. So if you, you know, anyone who's, who's looked at observations of marine terminating glaciers know that it's, it's generally common sense, um, or it's widely known that at many glaciers, they tend to sit at these bedrock peaks, like right 
next to these bedrock peaks for long periods of time. So what I'm showing here in this plot, uh, I'll make the first waste faux pas and that I'll show uh, Greenland observations here. Um, this is a, a set of six glaciers in central West Greenland from um, a study by, by Ginny Catania and company um, two years ago. Um, and what I've done here is I've just shown uh, in the left panel the terminus position at um, five glaciers that have largely remained in the same position where the terminus has largely remained in the same position over the satellite era, so approximately for the last 50 years. Um, and what you can see in each of those cases on the right panel is that uh, those termini, those uh, quote unquote stable termini um, are sitting just downstream of peaks in the bedrock topography um, that is within about a kilometer of peaks in the bedrock topography. And you can also look at uh, paleoglaciological evidence from the Ross Sea. So this is a, a region in the Ross Sea where there's some really excellent multi-beam uh, bathymetry data. Um, and there's widespread evidence in places where there are these um, seamounts uh, on the floor of the, the Ross Sea um, that there are also grounding zone wedges, which indicate that during the retreat uh, of the Antarctic ice sheet um, at the end of the last glacial period, that the grounding line stabilized um, at these bedrock peaks for, for long periods of time. So there's extensive observational evidence which shows that this is the case, but it sort of defies our conventional thinking for you know, where, um, where grounding lines should be stable or most stable and where they should persist for long periods of time. And so how can we, we reevaluate this? And I, I won't go into it here, but there's also a number of studies which show that um, Thwaites and Pine Island um, have also spent um, long periods of time during the Holocene, um, seemingly stable at these bedrock peaks. So the, the way that I came to this project was that I was doing numerical simulations actually back in grad school um, using this very simple uh, bed geometry. So what you can see here is an idealized bed geometry where there's a generally a prograde slope, but there's a short piecewise region of retrograde slope and then a very sharp bedrock peak, actually like a mathematically defined um, sharp bedrock peak. And so what I'm showing here are four examples where I have four versions of this idealized um, bedrock peak. And then if you look at numerical simulations which in which the surface mass balance but the same thing can be done with ocean melt um, is instantaneously reduced by 40 percent and then the grounding line is allowed to evolve what happens is that the grounding line retreats up to the bedrock peak and then it either pauses there or it actually persists there for a period lasting anywhere from decades to centuries to sort of an indefinite period of time it actually stabilizes there and so in all these situations, the bedrock peak is in exactly the same place. The topography is the same everywhere else, except for the reverse sloping part of the bed, where I impose in these four different cases, just a different retrograde slope. And so what's going on here? Okay, so uh, I'll skip through this real quick. Um, what's going on here is that as the grounding line approaches the retrograde slope, so this plot on the right shows um, how much the grounding line flux departs from the conventional theory that doesn't take into account the bed slope. Um, so that are like these lines are that are high up on this plot on the right are places where the grounding line fluxes is, is very close to the conventional theory. And then as the lines move to the left on this plot, as you're approaching closer and closer to the bedrock peak, that is as this x-axis goes towards zero, um, the grounding line flux departs more and more, in fact, departs tens of percent from the traditional prediction. And these are all steady state um, simulations here. So what's happening here is that basically as the grounding line is approaching the bedrock peak, um, the grounding line flux is reduced by tens of percent um, due to the influence of the reverse sloping bed upstream of, of the grounding line. So essentially what's happening is as the grounding line is getting closer, um, you have this region of reverse sloping bed in which the driving stress is uh, due to the bed slope is in the opposite sense of the normal driving stress. Um, so this is to say it's just it's locally reducing the driving stress in the region of the grounding line, which is uh, causing this reduction in grounding line flux. So as you get closer to the grounding line in these cases with these bedrock peaks, or as you're getting closer to the bedrock peak, 
Um, what's happening basically is that the flux um, that is going across the grounding line is reducing and the flux that is coming upstream is also reducing. So this is just overall reduce, or, uh, decreasing the rate of thinning at the grounding line and basically shutting down retreat um, potentially for very long periods of time. And so this, these periods of terminus persistence at these bed peaks um, doesn't, these aren't only periods or these aren't periods where there's no mass loss occurring in the glacier. So here's just from these two numerical examples. Um, here you can see the thinning that's going on 100 kilometers upstream of the grounding line. So you still have lots of thinning going on in the glacier upstream of the grounding line. Basically, the shape of the glacier is still changing, but the flux through the grounding line is decreasing and the, the grounding line retreat has pretty much stopped entirely during this sort of transitory period. Um, and at the same time, that, that thinning is causing um, driving st stress to lower just about everywhere upstream of the grounding line and also causing slowdown. So if we again look at observations from these, um, these six uh, stable or supposedly stable marine terminating glaciers in central West Greenland, what we see is that exactly this is happening. If you look upstream of the grounding line, even though the glaciers are not retreating, there's significant thinning going on upstream of the grounding line uh, and also slowdown occurring as well. Okay. So I just have one more slide and then I'm gonna, gonna wrap up. Um, so I've, I've actually talked mostly about Greenland observations here, um, but what I wanna show is that, so, so what we've done is we basically developed a theory where we can calculate this parameter. So this parameter down here, which is basically the overburden stress um, at the grounding line divided by the basal shear stress projected onto the bed slope at the grounding line. And essentially what this parameter, it's a dimensionless parameter, what it quantifies are places where the bed slope will be just as important as the bed depth in determining the grounding line flux. And so we can calculate this fairly easily over all of Antarctica. We can calculate it also over all of Greenland, although I won't show that here. And what you can see, so places where this, the magnitude of this parameter is greater than one are places where bed slope will be important. And more importantly, places where this parameter changes by more than one over a relatively short horizontal length scale are places where we should expect or are sort of candidate locations where we should expect that the grounding line would pause during a retreat. And so I'm just going to show two places here. So zoom in on the sort of Amundsen sea embayment and also um, on the Seipel coast. And what you can see here is that there is a ton of variability. So even though some of these regions like the Seipel coast, for example, are typically thought of as having fairly subdued subglacial topography, What's going on here is that the bed is so slippery that tau b in this expression is quite low, and this more than compensates for the subdued, subdued uh, subglacial topography. So you still have many locations where you have this parameter changing very quickly over um, small horizontal length scales and potentially being locations where on a retreating grounding line, you could get pause, a pause of the grounding line um, uh, during the retreat. Okay, so I won't go into this because I just talked about all these things, but one last thing I'll say before I sign off is that we have um, some great opportunities um, for uh, postdoc um, at the Georgia, Georgia Tech Ice and Climate Group, uh, working on the Stochastic Ice Sheet Project and also some PhD positions open. So if you're interested in those things, uh, please reach out. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Uh, any quick question for Alex? Uh, if I'm allowed to ask, do, can you say anything about the, the length scale, vertical and horizontal, on which these bed uh, peaks are important? Yeah, actually. So I'll, I'll just briefly go back here. What you can see here in this plot on the left is that, um, so the, the x-axis is basically the number of ice thicknesses. So once the grounding line gets within about 10 ice thicknesses of these bed peaks, that's when you start to see the influence of this. And, and you can actually look at these stable, these, uh, these stable glaciers in central West Greenland, and you can see that they're all basically, they've all basically persisted within 10 ice thicknesses of um, large drops in this parameter. Um, so yeah, 10 ice thicknesses, so order kilometers. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Aaron. Aaron, could you share your screen and we can start.
And if, if you have more questions for Alex, you can just type in in the chat box. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I will hopefully keep this a little bit on the short side since Christian gave a great talk on some of our analyses that are ongoing. Um, I just wanted to provide a little bit of the of a broader context um, for thinking about the future from building on what, um, what Christian showed us this morning. And so again, this is part of the, the Tarzan project, um, which is one of the uh, International Thwaites Glacier collaboration projects. Um, and we are focusing on the eastern ice shelf of the Thwaites Glacier and its potential for uh, change over the next decades and what that means for acceleration of uh, of the of the um, of the up, upstream part of Thwaites Glacier, and so we spent a long, a, quite a bit of time here. Uh, hopefully, you guys can see my cursor in this kind of boring part of the eastern ice shelf. Um, and Christian, oops, there we go. Um, Christian already showed us a few things going on here. So this is just a Landsat image from January 9th. So this is right after we left or right around our last days here. Um, and I just want to point out a few things that will hopefully trigger some memories of what Christian said as well. So there's this long linear pinning point um, here that has been stabilizing this area for, um, for a while. This is the Thwaites Glacier Tongue that has been undergoing its own collapse and variations through time and is now mostly disconnected from the modern uh, flowing eastern ice shelf. The difference in flow speed from the eastern part of the Thwaites, it's about two thirds of the Thwaites glacier is flowing around 2000 meters a year. And then this one third of the glacier is flowing at only about 600 meters per year. So the big question that we're interested in is if we get rid of this ice shelf, uh, get rid of the buttressing affected caused by this ice shelf, how much will this necessarily um, accelerate and what does that mean for ice discharge over the next decades to century? And this of course will depend on our collaborators who are working in the melt, in the grounding zone and all the other teams that are working upstream. Um, but our most immediate question has been, what can we say about the likelihood of the buttressing uh, being lost and the changes in this ice shelf. And uh, so I'm gonna, this area is kind of this boring area that I'm gonna show you a bit, uh, that I'm gonna be talking about. The grounding lines in the past are shown here. Um, and, uh, and I did wanna point out that a couple of Christian's um, conclusions that he showed this morning is that the pinning point is showing weakness, especially in this western side of the pinning point um, due to that change in flow and the loss of the, the pull that the tongue had provided. Um, he also showed that this central shelf area shows um, thinning by up to, um, uh, sorry, thinning by a meter, 15 meters a year. The surface is lowering by about one and a half meters a year. I'm sorry for that, um, for that switch up there. So this is the surface lowering by one and a half meters a year. So it's a pretty extreme sort of sinking of this central part of the ice shelf, uh, which we didn't realize when we went down there, it looked relatively boring, but it turns out that this part of the ice shelf might be the key to the near term stability of this area. Um, so when I think about these ice shelves, we are thinking about the buttressing as a whole. So everything that's integrated that keeps the ice shelf together. And that is in part this pinning point, but as you can see here, we have lots of rifting that's starting to, um, and uh, actually I'm gonna, there we go. It's going to start. This is a the this is a the um, series of images that Christian also showed. Um, but what I want to show is that um, over this time period, um, the there's a lot of um, this is just the last several years. But the the crevasses here, the weakening here is um, helping the ice shelf lose some connection with the pinning point. We're still trying to understand that. But one two other key things to notice is this these rifts, the daggers that Christian mentioned that are growing somewhat at a rate of about two to three kilometers per year. They only appear in 2017 and then they shoot almost 10 kilometers across the ice shelf in just those few years. The other thing that he mentioned is this band of surface crevasses that appeared in two, about 2004 and uh, they are advecting 
towards this central kind of boring area. Um, and so one of the things that I've been looking at, and we have a lot of data that we're still processing, is what is this going to mean when these features, the rifts, the crevasses, this is a, this is a basal channel, they all start to um, interact here in the central zone. Um, and I showed a little bit of this back in uh, April in the IGS symposium, so you guys might have seen some of it. Um, I'm trying to provide a little bit of an update and not leave people behind who didn't, uh, didn't see that one. But one of the things that we're realizing that is likely very important is that there's a huge amount of basal topography, um, up to 30% of the thickness of the ice over just a kilometer or two. This is just one example, but we see the basal topography has some really strong, um, really strong relief over a good chunk of the ice shelf, much more than we expected. Um, and what can happen is that these very strong variations in ice thickness can easily lead to large localized um, strain under changing regional stresses. And in particular, um, this sort of boring part of the ice shelf where these are the GPS measurements that show the flow speed um, that Christian showed earlier as well and the flow direction. Um, this sort of boring part of the ice shelf in particular, which is where Christian saw this localized spinning of 15 meters per year, um, is uh, also has very strong surface topography that look like it's actually a continuation of the basal crevassing that is related to these surface crevassing. So there are lots of basal crevasses that, that extend transverse to the ice flow all the way up through this, um, this part of the ice shelf. And again, these are the, the, um, the rifts the daggers that we have been looking at. And they are within just a couple of kilometers of intersecting with our basal crevasse field um, that we have. And I don't have a synthesis of the radar showing these basal crevasses yet. We're still working on uh, picking good beds and making sure we interpret those correctly. But if you believe me that there's a whole bunch of, of transverse flow basal crevasses there. Um, this is a, the model results that Christian and, and some um, satellite image results that Christian showed, showing this strong change in trajectory of the flow that is why these rifts um, in this area have formed. And there is, right now, there is no likelihood that those rifts are going to close back up because the, um, the longitudinal strain associated with this area is really uh, slightly positive even. So it's not, it's not showing the compression that you would expect from a pinning point. And so what is happening in this future, future vision for this area? We see, again, uh, thinning, very strong thinning in this area, numerous basal crevasses, these fast extending rifts that are heading right towards this basal crevasse zone. This area is only about 300 meters, 250 to 300 meters um, thick. This area is thicker where these rifts are going through. So it's over 400 meters, but they're very quickly about to enter this, uh, this basal crevasse zone. Um, and, uh, and again, the overall longitudinal uh, strains that we see from analyzing the satellite imagery in the last few years show that there actually is very, possibly very little, um, very little, um, I can play that again, very little, uh, overall stress being transmitted from the pinning point all the way up to the grounding zone. So we may be at the point where we've mostly lost the buttressing due to the pinning point itself or where it's just, just going on the edge. So I have a feeling that a lot is going to happen over the next um, five to ten years. Uh, and I guess we are, as I said, we're deep, we're going through the details of these data and hopefully we'll come out with some more, uh, more details um, soon, but that's the big picture that um, maybe this thing will fall apart soon. Of course, I've been wrong in my predictions before about ice shelves falling apart. So <laughs> thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Erin. Any questions for Erin or maybe Christine? Hi, this is Indrani. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. sure. Hey, Erin, um, usually basal crevasses, we also see surface crevasses close to it. So do you think that these basal crevasses are newly formed? 
Um, that's a really good question. Uh, they do not have surface crevasses. They have a slight surface depression associated with them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think they actually are a, are possibly fairly recent and we are working on trying to understand the mechanisms that are generating them right now. But yeah, there are no surface crevasses associated with those basal crevasses. Which surprised us as well. <laughs> that's why, that's why we, so we wanted to drill there and do all this work there because we thought it was relatively boring for our field work. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Erin. Uh, our last speaker for this session is Matthew Hoffman. And you could start to share your screen. All right, is that working? Yeah. All right. So uh, the talk I'm going to give today is about um, the sensitivity of, of coupling the solid earth and ice sheet models for Thwaites Glacier and the sensitivity of sea level rise projections to both the earth rheology and the coupling timescale between these systems. And this was work that was mostly done by Cameron Book, who was a student working with me last summer, who's now just started a position at NOAA. And this is in collaboration with Sam Kachuk at the University of Michigan, um, as well as Jeremy Bassis and Stephen Price. So Sam was the one who uh, has written the GIA model that we're using here. And I'll, this animation just quickly demonstrates one of the, the main takeaway messages uh, of the talk, which is that um, when you include uh, glacial isostatic adjustment, uh, in a ice sheet model of Thwaites Glacier, you get a, a much reduced rate of grounding line retreat and sea level rise. Um, and I'll go into that more later. So just to summarize uh, kind of the background of this topic is, as we've heard already, we theories suggest that grounding lines on reverse bed slopes can be unstable and you can get the so-called marine ice sheet instability. On the other hand, we also know that bedrock uplift has the potential to slow grounding line retreat and um, subsequent ice sheet mass loss. But the amount of uplift um, that occurs is highly dependent on the earth rheology and uh, a low viscosity mantle allows for quicker bedrock uplift. So the modeling we're doing is kind of exploring the competing uh, effects of these two processes. So we're using a glacial isostatic adjustment model that um, treats the earth both as a viscoelastic material. And traditionally, um, we've, uh, in the GIA world, you can consider the Maxwell time to tell you kind of the time scale at which the earth response is going to have a, uh, be dominated by a viscous uh, process versus elastic processes. And that is on the order of centuries. And so the kind of traditional line of thinking is that at short time scales, that only the elastic response of the earth needs to be considered and the viscous response doesn't matter. However, recent observations have shown that beneath West Antarctica, there's a very low viscosity mantle, uh, two to three orders of magnitude lower viscosity than the global average and therefore viscous responses are likely to be important on decadal timescales. And just this kind of ballpark estimate for a Maxwell time in West Antarctica is just something like a few years. So that's what um, we'll be seeing here. And so a recent paper by Sam Kachuk um, using this GIA model that includes both the elastic and viscous response uh, applied for Pine Island Glacier shows that over 100 about a, a century and a half of simulation here, the mass loss or sea level equivalent rise um, when GIA effects were included is uh, substantially lower than ignoring the effects of GIA. And this range of curves for when, where the GIA, GIA effect is included, the kind of the one closest to the no GIA case is the one that is essentially just the elastic response. And as um, you consider uh, lower viscosities for the mantle that are in line with estimates for West Antarctica, the amount of sea level, uh, sea level rise equivalent uh, drops substantially by up to 30% and that sees higher curves. So we're um, applying the same type of uh, 
simulation for Thwaites Glacier in this study. And as I mentioned, this GIA model has a number of parameters. And I'm just going to skip to this table at the bottom and don't worry about the individual numbers. But um, these acronyms here, we have uh, two low viscosity cases that are kind of the N member viscosity supported by um, the uh, by Leda observations. And then the TYP is kind of the typical mantle uh, properties uh, that are the global average. And then there's an intermediate case that has similarly low viscosities, but a high flexural rigidity of the lithosphere layer. And then we're using the Mali ice sheet model. This is a regional domain of Thwaites glaciers. And everything in italics here kind of indicates that these results are in some sense preliminary or maybe um, will provide a lower bound on mass loss. We're a relatively uh, low res resolution of four kilometers with these preliminary results I'm showing. We're using a linear basal friction law with a fixed uh, temperature field and fixed calving front and, a, and climate forcing that doesn't change in time as well as a parameterized ice shelf melt from the ISMIP-6 experiments. So these are kind of holding present day uh, conditions uh, forward in time, but letting current uh, 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 transients within the model evolve. So this shouldn't be considered as like a true projection of future mass loss, but it's uh, a reasonable model setup to explore these GIA sensitivities. So this is just the animation I showed on the title slide. Um, the grounding line started, originated at the, the, the gray line. The orange line is when we include GIA with the most aggressive low viscosity mantle conditions and then the white line is with no GIA. And so you can see after uh, three centuries here that when we include the viscoelastic uplift, there's a substantially less uh, grounding line retreat than if we ignore that. And this is very sensitive to the rheology as you'd expect. So this is the sea level equivalent mass loss after 300 years. The purple line is the no GIA case, and the red line is what you would get running the, ice sheet or the GIA model with the properties that are typical of kind of the global average mantle. And you can see there's a very small difference than if you, you could essentially ignore GIA under those types of mantle conditions. And most of that response is due to the elastic response. But when we have the low viscosity mantle, the um, viscous adjustment of the mantle is able to happen on decadal time scales, and we get uh, substantially uh, more, or sorry, substantially less mass loss, up to 70% less in the most extreme uh, parameter settings. And then we've also wanted to understand the sensitivity to the coupling interval, and this kind of gets at the, the feedback time scale between the solid earth and ice sheet dynamic systems. And these simulations are all shown using the low viscosity one set of parameters, which are the most aggressive low viscosity values. And then the different colors are um, different coupling intervals. And the control case is where we have no GIA at all. And you can see that we need to have the GIA and ice sheet updating each other on the scale of a few years to fully resolve the feedbacks. And that if that's done only on the order of decades, that there's substantial errors in the simulation. Um, so we define this thing called the middling, minimum coupling interval, which we define as that which permits less than 5% error in cumulative glacier mass loss relative to coupling every year. So this can be evaluated over time. And you can see um, basically what I described previously is that for typical mantle viscosities, this is um, on the order of decades or centuries. But for the low viscosity cases, the model demonstrates this is below the time scale of a decade. Um, and so just kind of conceptually, what we're finding is that a weak rheology results in localized uplift, and it requires shorter coupling intervals to fully capture the effect of the grounding line, the effect of the glacial isostatic rebound before the grounding line retreats past the uplifted area. So that's the red case. But when you have a strong re rheology, it distributes the uplift such that um, as the, the grounding line will 
or the ice, the grounded ice will feel that uplift for quite some time, even as the grounding, if the grounding line is retreating quickly. Um, so to summarize, I think the kind of the two main takeaways are that um, the, the uh, viscous component of GIA can slow retreat of Thwaites Glacier by upwards of, you know, 50% on century timescales. Um, but this is, this uh, effect is, uh, requires a very uh, high frequency coupling between the models to avoid uh, inaccuracies. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you. Are there any good questions, Matt? If not, uh, then we will move to the discussion part of this section, uh, just to help you and remind you what talks were. Here is the schedule again, and brief kind of reminder. The first talk was by, by Christian Thomas, who talked about the changes in uh, phase its eastern ice shelf, and uh, he was describing the fact of, uh, of the behavior of lateral zones and um, observations, uh, field observations, as well as um, runs of uh, an ISSM ice sheet model uh, showing different behavior depending on the presence or absence of pinning points. Uh, then Ronnie Rees uh, talked about the history and the strengths of the oceanic force in, in sea level projections from Antarctic ice sheets, uh, and specifically with PISM. And uh, she discussed the effect of the parameterization of melt rates that depending on the uh, parameterization, uh, one could get a wild response uh, in models and a very different response for the same climate scenario. Um, the, very high one, RCP 8.5. Uh, then the next talk was by Toro Hartman about the effects of the atmospheric anomalies uh, on the uh, circulation and sub shell circulation and changes water masses um, on the Filsharoni ice shelf and the effect of Polinius uh, and sea changes in sea ice and uh, those effects on um, sub ice shell circulation. Uh, the next talk was by Christina Huba talking the uh, terrestrial origin of accreted basal ice on Ross ice shelf. She showed uh, very impressive um, videos from uh, a video uh, camera uh, that went through the borehole that they wheeled uh, through the Ross ice shelf. And in the second part of the session, uh, the first talk was by Alex Robel talking about the um, uh, effects of bad slope on stability of the ground. Of um, marine terminated glaciers and the stability of their grounding lines, how the changes in bad slope affects uh, that stability that um, the grounding line could sit on the reverse slope for quite a while before it reaching further. Uh, then Erin uh, Pettit was talking about the weights again and describing uh, Changes in the changes in buttressing and uh, of the plate glacier that uh, were observed uh, during field season. And the last talk was very like, recently, a few minutes ago, by Matt Hoffman uh, describing the effect of GIA uh, on the ground line uh, dynamics of plate glacier and uh, that the visco mental viscosity. And the fact that it's quite low uh, could lead to the fact that one has to take into uh, account not only elastic response of um, the glaciostatic adjustment, but viscous response as well. So uh, I would suggest that um, you start IZ unmuting yourself and asking questions or raising hands uh, via participants or just typing um, questions in chat box. So are there any questions to any of these speakers? Uh, 
I'll ask a question of Erin, if I may. This is Julia. Go ahead, Julia. Um, hi, Erin. I enjoyed your talk, and I was teaching earlier today, so I missed the initial part of this session, including Christian's talk. So I was glad um, you repeated um, some of his slides that I missed. Um, so my question for Aaron, and it's okay if Christian answers too, since I'm not sure exactly what he covered. Um, you know, Indrini asked about how did the um, crevasses in the base of the ice line up with any surface crevasses? And so Aaron already answered that. My question is, you know, because of course Tarzan includes a marine component as well, and so how do you think that structure in the eastern ice shelf and the topography at the base of the ice lines up with the bathymetry? Oh, um, well, the, it's about 800 meters deep there. Um, and so I don't think that there's any, like the immediate zone of those basal crevasses are not necessarily over over the over any particular part of the the basal of the the symmetry um, okay. they will there it will provide some complications in the flow patterns as we start to get into what the flow looks like under there because there's a lot more basal topography than I think we than than you know, we anticipate in terms of estimating the flow and how that affects the melt rates. Um, when you have these very intricate basal topography, the flow is going to work its way through yeah. that basal topography. Um, yeah, and so when we get the complicated bathymetry and then the complicated bottom of the ice combined, that's going to be really hard to model the flow. <laughs> yeah, I think it will be hard to model the flow. And we're, what we're doing right now is focusing more on understanding what are the primary processes since we can't just put together a nice ocean model that has that much detail involved. Um, but we are thinking about that. We're trying to understand what the processes are that are generating. And, and we, all of these, this basal topography is, is depending on what it is and where it is, whether it's related to a, a basal channel or these basal crevasses, there's a lot of potential for feedbacks and interactions between the melting um, and the, the, ice, the ice response in terms of you know, further crevassing or not, or how it's interacting with the rifts. Um, all of that is going, there's the potential for feedbacks between the melt pattern and the, and the basal, basal topography. So yeah, we don't have answers to all that yet, but we are thinking very hard about what some of these key processes are and what those feedbacks might be that could help. Okay. Um, but it does not make for a very simple interpretation of the, of the basal melt regime. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions to the speakers? I have a maybe somewhat related question for Christian. And that is um, with the ISSM modeling that you did, did you need to, or did you choose to do any tuning of the basal friction or the degree of groundedness at that pinning point on the Eastern ice shelf before you did your perturbation experiments? Yeah, hi, Matt. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So how did I did this ungrounding and ISSM uses this mask that tells if a pixel is grounded or not. So I just drew an outline of the pinning point, let's say, and say all these pixels that are one in my outline should be zero. So I immediately remove basal friction at this point. And then the model uses the shallow shelf approximation instead of the higher order model equations at this point. Um, and any other tuning, I have reduced the ice temperature by five degrees. But this is the bulk estimate for the entire computational domain. Does so that was, answer your question? Um, I guess specifically, was there a tuning target? Like, were you trying to 
reproduce observed velocities on the ice shelf as best you could or something similar or exactly. were you in okay so that was you. i've used um the measures ice velocities to tune my data to okay and then how do you determine how much basal friction that pinning point should have because that's something i know that models can be pretty sensitive to for the thwaites ice shelf um how did i do that i just changed it um, i think in the parameter file or in the config file it gives you some rough bounds and i put them in and so ah, uh, my problem is more in the entire area so it should be an ice thickness issue and not a basal friction issue. Okay. And then do you know if the subsequent perturbation experiments you did would be sensitive to the choice of either the basal friction or the extent of groundedness that you've, you've come up with for that pinning point? Yeah, I'd love to run the pinning point in grid south, so on the western side of the pinning point. And instead of saying it's fully grounded, just say it's partly grounded by playing around on the base of friction mm -hmm. and then showing that these recent results from Lancet feature tracking can be better reproduced as they are at the moment. I yeah, that's a good place for future work. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like a good idea. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Or, uh, can I follow? Can I follow up on that? Yeah, uh, Christina. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Christina. Yeah. Oh, I was just um, thinking about the selection for uh, basal friction on that pinning point um, that could affect the inversion or what you think the ice viscosity is as well, right? So if you're inferring two properties there, they're related to each other. Have you, did you sort of explore that at all, Christian? Um, I haven't explored that at all at, at this stage. It was more um, what are the relative importance of these processes. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Christina. Thor, would you like to ask Christina your question directly or would you like me to read it out? No, no I'm, I'm happy to read it. I was okay. just uh, yeah. putting okay. it there okay. so people yeah. can I was uh, really two questions quickly. Uh, I was wondering if that drill site from where you then find the end glacial uh, features and the sediments, if that was chosen on purpose to sample sort of that kind of uh, material. Uh, and and uh, the other question is uh, when there is now this hypothesis that this is meltwater that is refrozen on the terrestrial side. Uh, this meltwater, wh where, where does that come from? Is that more like locally generated in that crevassing process or even surface melt? Or, or is that something that it is likely arriving there from, from far away through the hydraulic uh, subglacial network? Uh, Kara, thanks. These are both good questions. We did not pick this site uh, based on what we expected to see in, in this sense. In fact, the um, phase sensitive radar uh, observations that we'd already made, or kind of in the in the vicinity, didn't give us any indication that uh, of what the site would be like. We were expecting there to be some melting, kind of a slushy base to the ice shelf, uh, based on the diffuse return. Uh, and it turns out that it's a diffuse return in the face sensitive radar because it's a heavily crevassed. But, well, it's a heterogeneous material, right? So we imagine that there are crevasses with this other ice filling them on the bottom. Um, the second question, Lyft Glacier is not a particularly large glacier, so we think we still need to do this calculation, but our idea is that it's got to be basal melt water that's being collected over a lot of that catchment in order to get enough of it. Everywhere we cross the flow band, um, kind of up and up and downstream around the borehole site, we see this ice. And for there to be 60 meters of it, um, you know, there had to be, has to be something like that kind of thickness or a little bit more that was accreted on in the first place. So there's a lot of, a lot of melt water. So it must have been collected from the catchment. Thanks. A quick follow up. Are there any plans to go upstream of the grounding line and reel the glacier to confirm? 
No worries? No, sadly. How oh, come? <laughs> well, I would love to go there. It's a beautiful spot. Um, it's an interesting spot, right? Who knew? There's, there is interesting geology around there. Um, there are different rocks that, that we might have seen are in the sediment from the ice that we didn't see, which is um, worth considering. But it's a pretty small sample of a pretty big flow band or, you know. Sorry, I'm spamming you guys in the chat. I had also a follow-up question to Alex, actually, uh, refining my question that, that I asked before. I understood that these 10 times the ice thickness would, would be sort of the, the radius of influence these basal peaks had. Um, but is that, or, or is that also the scale that the length scale of such a basal peak itself that it must have to, to be influential? Like, or can that just be a very pointy like a needle or whatever uh, and then also do you know anything about the, the vertical scale these things need to have just to get an idea how big these landforms need to be to make a significant difference to the grounding line which we yeah um, those are both great questions so I think my intuition on the horizontal length scale of these peaks um, would be larger than one ice thickness, just because that's our sort of general intuition about, you know, how large um, subglacial roughness has to be to be sort of influential in sort of the viscous dynamics um, of ice flow. Um, obviously, there's, you know, form drag going on at the bed and, and these sorts of things. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of a separate question. Um, so yeah, one ice thickness would be my intuition, but I, I don't have like a definitive answer for that. Um, and then as far as like the, the vertical profile, I think it really depends on what the typical bed slope is um, in the region, um, because that will then influence what shape the glacier takes. Um, and, you know, or the, the sort of the surface slope of the glacier, and then that will, so in, an, in a region that is generally very flat, you would, you know, perhaps expect that um, bedrock topography, relatively small bedrock topography can still be influential. Whereas in a region that's generally quite steep or jagged, then, you know, something would have to be large to basically, you know, be important sort of in that context. Um, so that's sort of my thought. I, I think the, you know, the examples in those sort of idealized uh, simulations that I was doing, you know, the, the bed slope was relatively, the sort of background bed slope was relatively subdued. And that's why these relatively small bed peaks of the order of, you know, meters to, you know, maybe, ten, you know, tens of meters um, can be quite influential um, in that situation. But, you know, this, you know, we, we did this in idealized simulations. You can look at a whole range of modeling simulations of, you know, Thwaites and, you know, uh, Pine Island and, and lots of places and you see exactly this sort of thing. Um, so you, you, you basically see these slowdowns um, or depending on the forcing, they could even be, you know, full on, you know, pauses in the grounding line retreat. Um, at these, you know, people have called them like speed bumps or, or things like that um, in the bedrock topography. And so they don't have to be um, all that large um, in places with relatively subdued topography, like in, in West Antarctica. Alex, uh, you have a question. Sorry, did somebody want to ask a question? No. Okay, can I ask a follow-up? I'm happy to yeah. wait. Yeah. No, no, it's all right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Was there someone else as well? I will ask up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I heard my own echo. <laughs> anyway, um, Alex, I thought that presentation was, was very neat and it kind of explained this illusory thing that we see in models and actually pulled up some animations of Thwaites retreats that show exactly that. So uh, my sense from the, what you described is that most large-scale numerical models have the appropriate 
representation to capture this? Is there some sort of minimum model or minimum theory that you recommend to ensure that this effect is accounted for? And then a second question is, if this metric, this ratio is sensitive to the basal shear stress, it seems like future evolution of basal conditions, say as the grounding line retreats would be important. So is that something that you've considered when you looked at your mapping of where this ratio might be important? In other words, regions that are far back from the grounding line presently might have a higher basal shear stress than they would when the grounding line is in close proximity due to adjustment of the basal hydrologic system. Yeah, um, so as to your first question, I think basically any sufficiently resolved SSA model will do it. Um, I, I'm trying not to frame this work in the way of saying like, uh, you know, models are missing something. I mean, the theory is missing something, but there are very few models nowadays that prescribe grounding line flux based on um, sort of uh, the old boundary layer theory. Um, so I think most models will see this and that's why, you know, what you see in your simulations what we saw in our Thwaites simulations from last year, you know, going back to lots of papers. If once you start looking at these simulations sort of like through this lens, it makes a lot more sense um, to sort of think about, um, you know, what, what does it mean when we say like this is stabilizing at a bedrock peak and, um, you know, it, it isn't always the case that it's stabilizing, it's just sort of transiently slowing down. Uh, as to your second question, so the way that we made or that I made this map that I showed at the end is I assumed that the basal friction was um, basically equal everywhere to the, the current inversion that you would get. Um, and, and so we, we use the inversion that's consistent with um, bed machine, both for Greenland and Antarctica, um, that, that met you um, produce, sorry. Um, that met to produce for, for ISMIP-6. Um, and so um, there is an argument to be made that the general, generally you would expect that as the grounding line retreats, that the basal friction at the grounding line should generally decrease, not increase from where it is today. And so in that, what we call the parameter gamma, in that expression for gamma, um, since tau b is in the denominator, that means that as that drops, gamma will go up. Mm -hmm. So basically the calculations of gamma that we do that, to make these maps um, of this sort of places of potential slowing is a conservative estimate yeah. um, that in general, we would either expect that the thickness at the terminus is higher than flotation. It can, it can only go in one direction, really. It can only be higher than flotation. And generally, we would expect that basal friction would be lower. So if anything, gamma would be higher than what we calculate. OK, cool. Uh, I have a couple of questions to you. Yeah. Sorry. So you mentioned melting. How do you account for melting, and where does it come from? Um, so you're saying in these, in these numerical experiments? No, you mentioned melting, so it wasn't clear to me because if you are considering a classical marine ice sheet instability configuration, there is no role for melting whatsoever. So I am just curious uh, how you get melting into your system at the first place. So, okay, so in the transient simulations that I showed, right, we like impose some change, for example, in the accumulation rate, or you know, in alternative simulations that look very similar to the ones that I showed, we impose um, a melt rate right at the grounding line. Um, so that's in the transient cases, and and you're correct that right in the classical theory, there's there's sort of no room for the transients, um, or uh, at, at least it it you know doesn't describe the the transient flux. Um, but what I, when I showed basically how the flux evolves as you get closer to the bed peak, those were for steady state simulations, right? So I don't know if that answers your question. Not exactly, but it's all right. Um, the second part is uh, what's your sense on the effect of the um, second dimension 
because you are still working in the flow line, one cup along the flow with no fact of two-dimensionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's definitely a role for the second dimension and, you know, when trying to interpret observations, for example, of this sort of persistence behavior, or this persistence at peaks, you have to look at, you know, the possibility that the trough might be constricting at those places where you have bed peaks or, you know, things like that might be going on. Um, but as far as the, the basic mechanism, so in the absence of significant changes in lateral construction, um, you know, we would expect these dynamics to be valid regardless of whether there's significant lateral shear stress going on? Uh, not necessarily lateral shear stress, but you know, flow or rather the ice flow even we consider like what I SSD and lubrication theory to still mm -hmm. dimensional and the flow can go around your obstacle, not only over it because at the moment, your geometry is such that whatever is happening, it is only over your peak, and therefore the grounding line gets stuck on whatever that peak. Mm -hmm. In reality, or not necessarily in reality, but even if you allow second dimension, your eyes can flow around it. Mm -hmm. So and my question is, do you have a sense how that would affect the, whatever you are describing? Yeah, I mean, definitely the, the quick answer is no. <laughs> um, That's fine. I, I think, you know, but I'll, I'll, I'll do the, the thing where I, where I make a guess, uh, which is that, you know, you're, you're still, you're putting a big reverse sloping bed, right? If you have a peak, then by definition, that means that there's some portion of the bed that's reverse sloping. And so that is going to influence in some way, right, the, the flux that's then happening downstream. Now, if it's, right, like, you, you can take this to the extreme example and say like, let's just put like a, a single point <laughs> in the middle of the glacier, right? And then allow flow to go around it. And I totally agree that like, as we take that pinning point and make it smaller and smaller, the influence is gonna be such um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not gonna be important. Um, I would say my intuition from looking at observations um, is that, even localized peaks within an otherwise broad 2D flow can have a significant influence on that grounding line stability. And that, so for example, those like, uh, you know, it, it's the geological observations, but those uh, seamounts in the Ross Sea, like you see these grounding zone wedges, which are on the seamount, but then also extend sort of laterally away from the seamount as well, which, you know, is indicative that basically the seamount is producing some amount of persistence or stability of the grounding line over a sort of a, a longer lateral area than just the extent of the seamount. Thank you. Uh, Matt, you had several questions to different speakers. Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's one question to all three. Um, I'm just a simpleton observationalist, so I go out and collect observations for you all to play with. And uh, I heard some scary things that we need uh, slopes that are kind of order 10 meter, maximum 10 meter changes over less than an ice thickness. We need to know mantle viscosity, which we barely know anywhere on earth. And we need to get better ocean parameterizations. And so like these are near impossible observations to make. So are there places we should be focusing on to like, put a big effort to, to measure th that one really hard parameter in one place? Should we be trying to do some inference or in, uh, along longer length scales or wider regions? I guess like where can I go to help you? Uh, and I'll throw that to Alex, Rania, and Matt. I can, I can go first because I'll, I'll just be quick, which is just, basically 10 ice thicknesses upstream of the grounding line. Like if, if the question is, you know, sort of decadal or multi-decadal scale simulations and we're caring about retreat that might, you know, occur on that time scale, then, you know, stuff that's going on just upstream of the present day grounding line, I think would, would be the most useful. And I know that that's also tends to be the place that is the hardest to observe, um, you know, but, uh, 
yes, yeah, certainly that would have a big influence on, you know, whether, uh, you know, a particular glacier unpins or, you know, retreats from the, the peak that it's currently at or not. Matt, would you like yeah, to? I could jump in. Um, I guess the modeling study I showed was motivated by observations of from this Barletta paper of bedrock uplift at none attacks in the region. So that is where this low is one of the sources from which the low mantle viscosity has been inferred. So, you know, more of that type of information. If there's some observational way to accurately estimate bedrock uplift beneath ice, that would be of high value. I don't, but we're talking about centimeter scale accuracy required, and I don't know if that's possible. Ronya, do you have anything to add to Matt's question about? Yeah, maybe just uh, very quickly. So, um, yeah, I mean, for my side, it would be very valuable to have, for example, information about uh, individual ice shelves, like how how uh, is their response in that thing, like in a, in a bulk sense to linked to changes in the ocean. And this is probably something you can observe best in in a region with high variability, like the Amundsen Sea region, for example, or for Totten uh, Glacier Ice Shelf. Um, and then in the second step, of course, it would be fantastic to better understand uh, if this sensitivity is different in different locations of the ice shelf. But I mean, that's, that's a lot of work. Matt, I was actually going to... Yeah, I was going to bring up the, the different locations for the ocean parameterization. I was wondering if uh, you could comment on the fact that, like on the deep Seipel Coast, far south Seipel Coast, you know, the parameterizations don't really work because we have this uh, diffusive staircase that uh, it doesn't have these tidally mixed zones. Um, have you thought about kind of evolution of parameterizations as you go from one ocean regime that may be more stable to, you know, all of a sudden CDW running up on there. No, that's a really good point. Like to um, to focus on the different modes of melting, for example, in in the ocean parametrizations. I don't think we have that. We, I don't think there is any parametrization uh, existing at the moment that does it. So I think that's definitely a good way to go. And then um, I think another way to go is to uh, to include maybe the dependency on basal slope into the parametrizations, uh, which is tested in some at the moment, I think. Um, yeah, no, but that's a good point. I have a related uh, question. For I, I, would, yeah, I would also give a reply to that one, actually. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, I think this, um, this discussion was about two different different uh, flavors of parametrization here because I think what Matthew is referring to with the with the staircase is really sort of the turbulence in the ice ocean boundary region and and things like that. But the parametrizations that are currently applied for large scale ice model simulations are actually much coarser uh, parametrizations that prescribe sort of which type of water masses at all make it into the ice shelf cavity. And uh, so, so the first one is really concerned about the mixing physics. The other one is more concerned about uh, a large scale circulation issues. And uh, for, for that one, uh, really, I think uh, constraining the bathymetry underneath the ice shelves is really key because that are the blocking obstacles for any warm deep water or whatever to flow in. Uh, and, and also sort of work more on, on, on that ocean modeling side that brings us to the scales where we can then start talking about the ocean interface uh, boundary layer physics. Are there any questions to the speakers or just in general something to bring to discuss? 
I'd just like to say on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, thanks for everyone showing up to our first virtual waste workshop session. This is certainly an experiment. So I'm, I'm happy you're all playing along as are uh, the rest of the committee. Thank you guys too for putting all together. So I think it was a lot of fun. And if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank all the speakers. It is quite impressive that you were able to present everything very clearly in eight minutes. It's, yeah, my head is off. I wouldn't be able to do that. That's why I'm not talking. So thank you so much and uh, please join other sessions and um, I believe Matt will provide some instructions where we can follow up and uh, watch recordings and everything. Thank you.